Hello, adventurers, and welcome to Cast Friendship. My name is Shubham Mehta, and our guest today is Mamatos. You might know them as the writer, designer, illustrator behind creations such as the beautiful and thrilling TTRPG Arc, the dark and contemplative journaling game, The Mages, and what is low-key my favorite, Capybara Capers. Uh, Mamatos, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me here. Yes, I'm excited. Um, I want to dive right in with uh, when when I reached out to you and we were talking about like this conversation, uh, you said that you want to focus on um, giving yourself permission to create. And that really spoke to me because, you know, at least for me, it sparked this, um, it reminded me of this fear of failure and how that sto stops kind of every draft, every idea before it can be tested. Uh, so is that is that where you were coming from? Is that kind of where it starts for you? That you know you have to give yourself a moment to just I can it's fine. Is that where you were going with that? Uh, in a way, yeah, it was. I think this is gonna be a bit of a tangent, but oh. you have to trust me that it's related. Yeah. So my degree course is engineering, and I had risk management as an elective, and. For risk management, I learned that it's sometimes useful to accept that things will happen, but then frame your mind that now that you know that something will be happening, how will you approach it so that its impact is something that you can manage and you can still make a meaningful effort out of it. So. For me, as somebody who is an incredibly anxious person, there's always that shadow of doubt, uh, the shadow of fear of failure over creative works. And in a way, it has been a valid defense mechanism in the past. Because when you fail in the past, uh, it hurts you. So your your mind then tells you, oh, you have to be on guard against this failure. So there, we can't that away from our psyche. There is always that risk. So you have to manage that and accept it as part of you. And I think giving yourself permission to write is accepting that risk and saying, hey, I I see you. I see this fear of failure, but you know what? You were useful and you were a valid defense mechanism, but we can still work together and create something wonderful. So this is an ongoing process for me, and I'm not talking as if I've cracked the code. This is something I'm also still processing myself, but I think it has been a really a very helpful realization for me to not get stuck in the rut of being afraid of failure. I I think um like yeah I I I know exactly what you mean and it's it's the way you said it really uh I think captures uh the approach that is healthy in these situations because there's an instinct even when you identify that the reason you're not doing something is because you're scared to then be like okay I'm no longer going to be scared and that's that's not something I, I think anyone can really do because it's not a switch. You can't switch off fear. So it's far better to be like, okay, you're going to be in the room with me, but we are still going to do this. Um, you're going to, and maybe you can help me in the right times, but like now is not that. That's really fascinating. And I'm also glad that you mentioned that it's not something that uh, you've already cracked and it's a work in progress because, yeah, I think these things take a lot of time. And even the most experienced artists, they still feel it. It's just they are better at managing it. I don't think the fear ever goes. So that's really fascinating. Um, okay, so if you have, if you're gotten that first step down, like fear is going to be in the, we are still going to do this. Um, where does where does the process start for you? How do you go? Okay, I'm going to create some. Is it a doodle on a piece of paper? Is it a napkin sketch somewhere? What's the where does it start? Oh, it starts with 10 notepads and really fragmented <laughs> keywords and key phrases. Sometimes it could be things like I'm watching a YouTube video about how Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind had really evocative Ojo for its time. And then that would spark a little nugget of thought being like, how can 
something that isn't visual spark and atmosphere in a tabletop RPG format. So these are very discrete, far away sources of inspirations. And sometimes, and oftentimes, they come from outside the tabletop hobby. And I try to write that in a notepad. And then one week later, I'm looking at it, trying to remember what it was all about. <laughs> right, right. OK. Uh, that's fascinating because for me, it, uh, I I get I'm also someone who likes to get uh, like just I I like literally on my desk right now I have like e cards that I can just use I have a yellow legal pad just for that and and they're all just covered in scribbles I have a whiteboard so I get that yeah that there's that and it's also because tell me if this works for you but is it because when you type it it feels far more permanent and harder to edit than when you scribble it on a piece of paper. Is it more malleable when it's on paper? Is that what it is? I think really it's more of a function of convenience because um, unfortunately I am more often on Discord and laptop than have access to notebook. But the important thing was to capture it and even for a fleeting moment, process it just for a little bit to help it be more sticky in your mind. And then later, hopefully, you'll remember <laughs> where it came from. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, geez, it's getting cold over here. I have the air conditioner Ooh. lost. Um, OK, so that's fascinating. Um, it gets sticky in your head. Do you have like a bunch of different ideas that you ha have brewing at the same time? Or is it like, OK, a game where there's an, the apocalypse is always going to happen? I want to develop this and then that's the focus for the next I don't know however long is it how does that go yeah it's usually the latter um I'm usually once I an idea like the little motes of idea start coalescing into a bigger ball it starts becoming like an like a giant boulder rolling down a right. corridor and I'm like trying to um not let it overwhelm me but it usually does and sometimes i would get into hyper focus mode and then keep on writing uh but there does come a point in the creation when i can put a little bit of distance between myself and the work and that's usually the hardest part because that's where the editing, the more ob trying to be more objectively analytical about what I've written happens uh, in the process. So there is a lot of like flaming, burning, writing happening when it happens. But then afterwards comes the, oh shit, I don't know if I like what I wrote. Right. <laughs> The, like the first draft is always fun to get through, but then the moment you have to do the second draft, it's intimidatingly like, oh, that I don't know where to even begin with this. Right. Um, but I'm curious. Did you always want to get into ga writing games? Because, like you said, you get get in, get an idea, then it, you know there's a focus state and there's a hyper focus state. But how did this start? Like, how did you discover that you want to go ahead and write games? It's not. I don't think it's something that people just pick up. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's not a. It's not a very common hobby. Um, game design really happened because I loved capybaras, and I played Grant Howitt's Honey Heist. Yes. And it thought to myself, there absolutely needs to be a capybara version, right. and now here I am. <laughs> I genuinely, I love. I, I've been only introduced to capybaras through you. Uh, your fandom for capybaras okay. is so is so massive that I was like, oh, there's this whole animal that exists and is like incredibly beloved. So you know, uh, that's that's on you. But I I want to know what you love about them because I'm I'm for example when it comes to animals I love all of them, uh, love my cat and like I get that because I I had the same thing where I played uh, Grant Howard's Sexy Battle Wizards. So I know I, I there's something about Grant Havitt, how he makes it so accessible that you're like, I want to play around with this. And then I was like, I'm going to do a cat story, uh, a one page RPG. So but I, for me, it's like, OK, I get it because I have a pet, right? I have a pet cat. What about capybaras? I genuinely want to know. What do you love about them? And they are just so chill. And 
This is gonna sound uh, melodramatic, but I discovered capybaras at one of the lowest moments in my life. Um, early 20s, had to take a leave from college, depressed, and then I don't know why, but suddenly Japanese zoos started uploading videos of capybaras. Right. And it was like suddenly relief from the world, just right. minutes of them. Yeah napping and i was at peace <laughs> I, I i i mean that's not melodramatic at all that's completely understandable i think animals in general can be so like i think for me definitely when i'm stressed one of the best things for me is to like just sit with my cat they're just so it's a relaxing experience i get where you're coming from and i'm glad that it worked for you so that's amazing um so now going back going back to game design you you decided to do capybara capers uh that was that was the initial drug and then what what came next because i know you've done i think six or seven different uh games at this point including uh discourse which is another one that i just love seeing exist it's brilliant uh but yeah tell me tell me how the process went from because that's also quite a journey you started i think 2019 and you've gone 2019 a one page rpg to now a whole book that got uh, funded in 23 minutes and is now getting its language versions, which, I mean, is quite a journey. Like, just to take a moment and be like, that's impressive. How, how did that happen? What was the slow, steady kind of rise? Uh, I think this is where community and finding fellow creators becomes really important because I was really high off the success. <laughs> Well, for me, it was successful because I was able to release Capybara Capers in the first place. But then um, I was a bit of a literature junkie in my college days. And it kind of went back to me during that time. Like, what if I could explore more themes outside of Capybaras, as well as that may seem? What if I could even explore themes such as identity, memory, or legacy? And being able to connect with other fellow creators at the time, other Filipino creators, meant that I could have people who I could bounce these ideas off and even try to play test them. And for somebody who is new, who is still learning to give themselves permission to create, this was incredibly a uh, powerful enabler in making sure there was a momentum to keep continuing creating not just stop at one i i, I it's this is a i'm loving this conversation just because so much of what you're saying really speaks to like the other experiences i've had similar ways um it's really hard i think to survive as an artist if you exist in a vacuum where there's no one really interacting with your work it doesn't need to be necessary validation but it needs to be some form of like interaction so that you can even tell whether you know, because I think art is often a way of connecting, isn't it? Like, uh, these games, they are ways of not only communicating, but they're ways of connecting with people. What are you going to do in a, as an island, right? Is that is that kind of what you mean when you say that the value of community and just uh, the high of, like, releasing Capybara Capers and then people going, hey, we get it, that's really fun, yeah. Is that is that where you were going? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, and of all the possible hobbies where you can create... I think there's very few that are more connective than tabletop RPGs. It's basically the entire conceit that you sit around the table and then you swap stories. And even in journaling or solo games, there is the sense of connecting to other worlds, fictional worlds, imagining yourself and empathizing with perspectives outside of your own. So there's always an empathetic connective link that mirrors itself, not just in how you create the tabletop RPG, but also how you consume, play, and build more stories on top of it. Tell me uh, this, because you said you were a bit of a literature nerd in, in college. Um... And now, you know, you've kind of gotten into, um, I say kind of gotten into tabletop role-playing games. You, you were deep into tabletop role-playing games. Um, would, you, would you consider just writing something like prose, like, a, say, a novel or a novelette or something like that? Would that be uh, another thing that you would do? Or is this, the, is this 
the game aspect, the play aspect, kind of what's going to keep you in this space, do you think? I think for me, um, that's an interesting question. It's challenging for me to write the pros aspect because I haven't yet developed the tools to hack. Uh, I very much still feel like an amateur, so for me, it feels like, oh, I could have a stronger grasp of tabletop gaming, so let's focus on that first. But there is a real pull and appeal to fiction writing as well, because with tabletop RPGs, there are conventions and expectations. Um, you don't have to follow them, but it starts becoming excessively hard to market the more you deviate from it. With prose, because it has such a rich history and so many variations and formats, there is a freedom there that is really compelling. So I think I just need practice. And then I will I can throw myself into prose, but it's not yet at that stage. I mean that's I think that's a great attitude because I'm I'm in the other way. I started with writing because I I'm I, I'm a screenwriter and and so for me tabletop is like the thing that I I have a lot of tools for finishing a story, but I have very few tools for like creating a tabletop thing. So a lot of it is me now going and seeing. And this is why I think baby steps help, like starting with a one page RPG, starting with a solo game, and then building out it's the same approach. I and I and yeah, man. Hopefully you do write because I'll be excited to read that. Um, Tell me about this. Uh, you said that there are conventions in uh, tabletop role-playing games that are, uh, you know, kind of very popular. And the more you deviate, the harder it gets to market. Uh, what are some of these conventions? Because oddly enough, I feel like I probably use all of them, and yet I haven't identified them. So could you highlight them for me, please? Oh, oh no! Now I feel like a student. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, that was me also. Uh, this is where I have to delve into the monopoly of D&D yeah, yeah, yeah. and how it has become the biggest gate for newcomers into the hobby, right. which has good and bad aspects to it. But when it comes to expectations, that also means that their formative experience of tabletop RPG has been the the critical role set up, the GM behind the DM screen, rolling for combat and initiative, and the GM player relationship that is not universal across all tabletop experiences. So when you have a large amount of players coming in through that funnel, expectations get shaped and reinforced. And deviating from that means that you risk alienating them. But that's kind of the sad thing about it because I feel like they would have so much to benefit from also experiencing those very experiences that they may feel alienated from. Well, that was a long sentence. <laughs> no, I think, uh, um, so this is something that even, um, I would say kind of the Seas and Dragons uh, Discord server has been uh, exploring. And uh, in fun ways, we do this thing where Every few months, every two, three months, there's a themed week. So uh, there's one week is PBTA, and there's another is uh, one-page RPGs. Uh, someone's doing an OSR week in the coming month. Uh, and that way, everyone who wants to at least try something new, and there's always people looking for games. So usually, you know, people sign up. Uh, they get to try it. And because of that, we've all been exposed to such a wealth of um, different games. And you're right, it, it is definitely initially that instinct of, uh, this is different and this is weird. And then you're like, oh, but this is fun because it, it does something so unique. Um, I No, I get what you're saying. And, and in fact, the, one of the best examples I can think of what kind of demonstrates what you're saying is uh, I have a friend who keeps asking me, uh, like I keep telling him that he needs to play uh, a PBTA game, like just play something like Masks or Dungeon World or anything like that. And he's only played 5e so far, right? Uh, and, and so I, he's like, okay, but what does that mean? And I'm like, well, this is kind of what you can expect out of it, right? This is how the game works. And he's like, okay, so, and he instinctively compares it to 5e. And I'm like, no, they're not, they're not two things that are going to, they're, they're doing different things. Comparing them isn't going to give you any idea of what 
each game is trying to achieve. 5e is trying to achieve something else. TBTA games are trying to achieve. I think I definitely get where you're going with that. Uh, it kind of blocks people's ability to see other systems approach them. Um, and yeah, literature would definitely be a lot easier to play around in that. So I feel like even in literature, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, all the genres have their own tropes. And, it, and people do find it weird when you break those tropes. Uh, there's definitely that. What did you say? Yeah, it's just that literature has had so much history that, I don't know, it feels like there are so many examples you could pull of genre breaking tropes and that have uh, much, have an audience that love them compared to genre breaking fantasy RPGs that have an audience that could break D&D's monopoly. It's, I don't know, it's strange. It could also be the lens of time because tabletop RPGs are very, right now, contemporary. It feels like we're living yeah. in an age or in a decade where tabletop RPG history is being made. Yeah. But for literature, it feels like we have the long lens of history to say, oh, there's been many outliers. It's not just a monopoly. And... Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many different cultures that have played around with literature, which I think brings me to my next point because you, the other thing you mentioned is being exploring themes through uh, systems. And I'm really fascinated by the themes you explore because um, obviously there is uh, the arc, uh, which is exploring kind of like the sense of a very pending sense of doom, literally. Uh, but there's also kind of mages which explores uh, the corruption of power or power corrupting. Um, and then I, I saw recently, I think you tweeted about, um, there was one theme and it was, I, I, I even responded to it because I was like, this sounds amazing. Um, do, do you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, it was it about um, looking for a home, but you're rooted in something. In, yes. you, know, you are longing for a home, but you are it but you are struggling with your own roots. Yes, exactly that. Because, so, just to give why I, that spoke to me, and please tell me why that, that how that team came about to you. Uh, but for me, it was because I grew up in India, then I moved to South Africa. I was there for like 10 years, and I came back. Okay? And so I have this weird sense of like, I don't know where I belong, and I, I, I have roots in both places, but it's very hard to then have like an idea of home, because homes in both places for me and every most people just have one place that they call home right like one village or one town or one house uh and so for me it's like oh i this, yeah this but where did that where did that come for you where did that theme come for you uh, for me it was the concept of found families and found homes are not nearly as simple as sometimes um inspiring or uplifting fiction may ask us to consider it sometimes relations and self-perceptions can be complex we may have found the people who love us we may have found a new home but that doesn't mean that there still isn't a vision of that other home you originally yearned for and that kind of interesting storm of balancing what you had dreamt for with the reality of your current situation now is what inspired me to try exploring that theme. Uh, I think as a child, uh, I grew up with certain dreams of when I grew up, I want to be X, Y, Z. When I grew up, I want to be accepted for ABC qualities that I've always wanted to be accepted for. But then, of course, life had other plans. And now I am at an age where I feel like I can strive to make that vision come true. Maybe if I put hard effort into it, I can make that vision a reality. But at the same time, I already cherish what I have right now. So I don't know. It's kind of tension that I felt like me had potential to be explored. Definitely. Um, I'm looking forward to whatever comes out of that theme. Uh, that would be exciting to see. Uh, tell me, how did, how did something like ARC come about? What was the spark that started that process? Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are games that are inspired by themes 
Sometimes there are games that are just inspired by mechanics. Part of ARC was because I wanted to know what kind of game would arise if you had a real-time component to it. It would obviously be a tense game, but is it possible to have a heroic game when there is a very strict timer breathing down your neck? And that was essentially how ARC eventually developed and fleshed itself out. Uh I mean, and it definitely shows because it's such a strong, uh, effective component in kind of creating the sense of tension. Um, what was the, I'm just curious, how long did that process take from like inception to, and also uh, when did you, were you like, okay, this is done and now I'm not going to revise this further? Oh God, that question, because I was revising it up to the last minute. <laughs> Um, originally, for example, uh, it was supposed to go on a crowdfunder 2020. It was actually originally supposed to go live October 2020. But then on October 1, I was confined to the hospital for a month. So that had to be completely postponed for one year. So actually, ARC was written 2019, but it was a completely different incarnate. Uh, 2020, I decided to retool major parts of it, eventually deciding um, there are good ideas, but let's develop that a little bit further. But unfortunately, I have a bad habit of thinking, what if we develop it a little bit more? A little bit more? The crowdfunder is already done and they're asking just a bit more. <laughs> so I think I am an editor's worst nightmare. Oh, I mean, at the end of the day, oh, how did, who, okay, so did they just have to take the book away from you? They were like, you can't touch this. What? No more. Exalted's like, no, I, you cannot. Or what, what, My I, friend told me, my friend had to stage an intervention and say, you can't keep editing it anymore. You have to print it now. <laughs> and, and because you did everything from writing it, designing it, and illustrating, and it is such a cohesive piece of text. When you look at it, uh, everything kind of flows from page to page in style, language, tone, uh, feel. But how, But usually these are things that are done by three separate, four separate people, and they have to work together to make that happen. Um, how did you manage your process? How did you manage, hey, designing is one thing, illustrating is another, and uh, what's it? Writing it is mm -hmm. another. How did, how, how did the, yeah, how did that happen? So writing and designing were a bit easier to blend together because eventually, um, because my corporate background is technical writing and that helped explain the design, the mechanics, and I also had a little bit of help from being a literature junkie from before. So for me, it, it seemed like blending old friends together. Right. But with the art, I had a, a bit of a cheat because a lot of it was old art. But it was easy to integrate into the game because I think they were both powered by the same thing, the desire to tell stories, to show scenes. So in a game about slaying the apocalypse and creating stories with it, Artwork that depicts story making fits in right well. And with my art uh, passion, which is drawing scenes that could have happened in a story, it seemed like a natural fit. It's, um, I know two things about the arts that one was that you also had, like in, in your adventure that you published, which is, um, Sunflower Blooms, uh, you used a lot of uh, uh, public domain art. Uh, like Klimt, Klimt, I can't pronounce the artist's name. Um, you, uh, you know the one I'm talking about. One, one, I also cannot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, 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 but was yeah. it Klimt? <laughs> yeah, I know the ones because I, 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 I stole that idea from you the moment I saw it. I was like, I am totally go. I found every public domain museum there is out there. I was like, I'm getting whatever art I need. This is a great idea because I also can't, I like, not I also, you can illustrate. I can't illustrate. So I was like, ah, this is my solution to making my work look pretty. But uh, you said that you had, uh, you have a hobby of 
drawing scenes that could have happened in a story. Well, talk to me about this. Is this like drawing scenes from a, say, if you read a book, uh, like, like fan art? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. um, I meant more of like, if I could write prose, right. but art. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, this was fiction in visual form. Right. As if it was a a scene playing out in some in some story that say Chekhov wrote, and then I decided to slice it, take a photograph at that exact moment. Right. But instead of Chekhov, it's some weird fantasy writer. <laughs> right. That's that's really fascinating. So from your technical writing work, uh, you get your game writing skills. Uh, from your literature junkie experience, you get your general like prose and tonality experience. Uh, from your illustration, uh, I wouldn't say fandom, but like illustration experience, you get the art part of it, of it done. And then all of this comes together to create this one cohesive. That I think that really speaks to how also, like I, I'm I'm sure you you've ex thought of this, but it's been a journey, right? Like the, you couldn't have done this, I guess, ten years ago. This had to happen when it did because only by then did you have developed all this. and oddly independently did you, when when did you play um grant Howitt's honey heist um i think i played it around 2017 or 18. right and then you yeah. go from there to okay yeah because that's fascinating right because you 2017 2018 you're playing this first thing until then you haven't really played any tabletop role playing I think oh I did play a couple. Um okay. I've played Fifth Ed, I've played Legends of the Five Rings, and one community event organizer had tabletop um events every few months where we could try out indie games. Right. So that was really instrumental in helping me realize that there's more to tabletop than wizards and warriors fighting dragons fair enough fair enough uh you will forgive me but the uh, uh table uh, arc adventure i'm writing totally has a dragon that you uh i'm t but I'm, I'm subverting it i'm I'm totally making a making it someone's pet dragon that you know is yeah but whatever uh yeah I, I i get where you're coming from though um so yeah that's fascinating uh because this also speaks to you being able to discover tabletop role-playing games and i know you've said that in um the Philippines, the Adventure League, and that is generally very present. Uh, but there are other tabletop role-playing games aren't that dominant visible. Okay? And then it was this one creator who made it accessible. What, what, have, uh, what has some growth? Have you seen any growth since then? Because that was 2017 in like how the community has expanded. Uh, have more games become the norm? The tabletop, tabletop games becoming more common? So I think during 2018, 2019, when the community events were happening, there has definitely been more interest in games outside of D&D. But since the pandemic, it's been a little bit hard. Um, for me as an indie creator as well, there is a, uh, I would say, a habit to not get too involved with D&D circles. And I think that has kind of uh, limited my ability as well to get the feel of how the scene is shifting or morphing. I do fear though that it, it may not have changed much since before times. And has kind of, at least for us, what happened in India was the pandemic came and lockdowns were in place. So a lot of it moved online. Um, and so that kind of created a way for a lot of people from across the country uh, to connect with each other, right? Have you noticed a similar benefit of moving online as opposed to looking for input? Um, no, and I think that's a lesson that we could definitely pull because that's that's such a powerful movement, um, making tabletop gaming more accessible through online. Yeah, because for us, the biggest problem is that we don't even have Adventure League or uh, and they're and uh, what do you call it? Board game places are very few, far and I would say there's like a handful in the whole country, uh, which is uh, which means that when we moved online, suddenly we were able to reach out to people 
who had always been playing it with their one group of friends. But now they were like, oh, wow, there's a whole server that we can constantly like bug for different types of games and people will be interested. So that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, th I would have thought that even over there, that would have been a big role. But you've, done, you've been doing a lot of work, I would say, um, in kind of creating a sense of community, at least through your own server, because I've been on there and I love how, uh, how that space is. Um, I have a specific quote where uh, in an AMA that you did, you talk about how uh, instead of kind of like breaking through, you approached it as um, kind of focusing on uplifting others and you made, and that felt more sustainable and emotionally fulfilling for you. Uh, can you talk to me about that? Because I feel like a lot of indie developers and creators are constantly worried about, I need to break through, I need to get noticed, I need to market myself. And I think that eventually takes a massive toll on your psyche. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, yeah, can you talk to me about that? Like how your approach was mm. about that? I think this kind of uh, is related earlier to our earlier topic of how tabletop creation is a, and tabletop creation and hobby is a connective experience. Because eventually just marketing yourself out there without any connections to nurture that is... Uh, it feels like a very hollow approach to something that is ultimately about human relations and the play experience. So I wanted to make sure that when I approach others or when I build bridges, it's always with the intent of making lasting, happy, nourishing connections. I, I really don't want it to be a transactional experience because when you turn it into a transactional experience, it stops being about the wonder of tabletop gaming and more about, I want to have power over you so you can uh, you can be a patron of my wares. It starts becoming a sale. But the people who play these games, who use their imaginations to explore other worlds, these aren't sales, these are humans. So I wanted to come from that place and I just, it just felt happier <laughs> uh, and more fulfilling. I, I love that statement. I think um, that really speaks to us um, at Daisies and Dragons as well, because when we were starting out, there was a very easy trap of like, um, okay, so we can put, totally make this a Patreon thing and we can start like service that we are providing and it becomes very transactional. But the thing is, there's already so many barriers to getting into games that you don't want to put another barrier in front of people and be like, hey, now pay us uh, for this thing that you can otherwise do for fun. And it's supposed to be a thing that we do for fun anyway, right? Uh, so I definitely see it. But tell me, how do you balance this? And I, I, and I, I do think you do it well. How do you balance this with the, of course, there's a part where you do have to sell the product that has taken time and energy to make. Uh, that can't... How do you balance that? Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing that um, building connections is great for community building, but when it comes to seeking remunerations for your effort, marketing does have a function and a use. So I think for me, it's really coming from a sense of not being exploitative, knowing what value it is, and always being aware of what it can mean to the other person like the the ordeal of being known the ordeal of having your product be known for what it can offer to them and I, maybe i've just been lucky but for marketing it's important to know what the other person can want and what you offer um i i like the word that you use the value because it's got a twofold meaning, like there's the material value of the up uh, thing, but there's also the kind of nourishing soul value of things, right? There's just when we consume art and when we interact with different pieces of literature or whatever, there is a value that it's adding to a life that can't be quite put into like monetary terms. And knowing that is, I think, a very helpful way of positioning it, if that's the right word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's 
And that's always the hardest question a new designer asks, how do I price? And there's no easy answer yet, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, when, so uh, I think there's this, I have a, a friend who's working on a game system and they and the I, original idea or the premise for the world, right? Uh, they, ca they came across that, I think, like online somewhere. Someone was just like, hey, here's a Tumblr post which vaguely talks about this general premise, like a three line thing, right? But they, that gem really sparked something in there. And then they went and created a whole uh, system around that thing. Um, now, there is this conversation of like, okay, is it viable to put this on sale? Because it's clearly a work of like time, effort, design, play testing. But at the same time, the idea kind of was born in the, in the wild. And um, also art is notoriously something where you borrow and sometimes steal unintentionally because you will see any like, that's a great idea. I'm totally going to. Um, so do you have any tips on how, to, how you would navigate? I think um, I'm going to approach this if from two directions. The first is, is there a point to selling your game? Like, I just made this in an afternoon. Do I have the balls to add a price tag to it? And I think the answer to that really is, what do you intend? Or what is the intent behind the sale? If the intent is to validate that it has value, there may be other ways to obtain that validation. If the intent is to find um, a living off of it or to buy yourself a snack or fuel more creations like it, then you will have to be a bit more intentional on how you sell it to people. You will have to be a bit more dedicated and yes, you should absolutely go for it. But I think, and this was also where I started um, at the beginning, I looked for sales as validation and I was crushed when the numbers weren't coming in. So uh, it, you should still put your game for sale, but you have to be absolutely aware that you have to be honest and upfront about your intent behind it as well. Uh, the second approach is um, thing and borrowing. There is a popular book that I have not read, um, Steal Like an Artist, yeah. but um, I've heard that maxim a lot of times. Art is inherently collaborative, I feel. I mean, even the very fact that we use public domain art to enhance our games speaks to that quality. There are several ways um, to justify or to approach it is the idea relevant has the idea been um used recently uh, or is it too vague or is it too central to your work i have known somebody who was heartbroken because their idea was stolen by somebody who saw what they posted in a discord and that happens, and that's that's kind of an asshole behavior. You always need to ask first if it's a personal or a Discord conversation. But I also think that when you express your idea aloud, that doesn't encapsulate the entirety of the work. Your execution, your expression will add dimension to that idea. So even if somebody steals your idea, that doesn't mean they're stealing your work it's still yours and you can still make it fully realized. I think, I think that's one of those statements that is often said, but it's also trickier to kind of come to terms with because uh, it's so easy. It's not, I wouldn't say it's so easy, but you, yeah, one will often say that, hey, it's your perspective, your execution that will make it stand apart. But it's so daunting to then try to do that while you already see something that's in the same space kind of already out there, right? Because it's not even like, oh, it's a work in progress. It's already out there. So then it becomes that much. Have you dealt with something like that? And if so, how have you uh, like overcome? Yeah, uh, sometimes there are art or game inspirations where I feel like, ah, I nothing I could ever do could top this. Right. <laughs> and usually the moment passes. 
because eventually, hopefully, I think to myself, I'm not creating to top this. Um, I want to make things because I love making things. Whatever I make will turn out different because my life experiences, my creative journey has resulted in a different me from them. I, I, I'm going to write that phrase down. Like, I'm going to make this. I want to make this. And that's, I think that's a great first step to focus on as opposed to, like, where is this project going to go? Uh, which perhaps brings too much burden the whole process. Uh, and I'm not exempt from this as well. It it flows out smoothly from my mind because I'm in an interview. But uh, earlier, a friend told me that you should not forget that you're making things because it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that's why... Uh, when I mentioned the thing about the sales, about being honest about your intent, that's why I mentioned that because your expectations around sales can place a burden on you when in in your heart of hearts, maybe you just wanted to make it because it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I think this is true for, I mean, it, it would be great if everybody rooting corporations could go about practicing it in the same way, but that's that's a big ask that I don't think is going to happen any time. Um, I, so just going back to um, because we were talking about community uh, on on your server, you have the Crucible where you regularly post prompts, and you know a lot of creators come up with their own little uh, pieces of fiction. Is there any particular prompt that has kind of like really uh, stood out or sparked a lot of conversation? And also, what's the general idea behind uh, doing these kind of things? Because I mean, yeah, there's definitely an aspect of like, hey, it's the server, there's activity, but I imagine there's more to it than. Mm. So for those who don't know, the Crucible is basically a creative writing challenge. And actually, um, it was inspired by Luca Rayets of UBG Fame's server, where he would post sometimes things like the XX random table of uh, prompt. But I thought of experimenting with that. And the first prompt I made was a hex map. And people were supposed to give descriptions of each tile. Yeah. And then I decided on a whim, what if the hex map suddenly shrank? What if some of the hexes suddenly became corrupted or changed nature? What if there was an overarching narrative behind the prompts all along? And it became a vehicle to explore unusual creative writing prompts that took advantage of Discord's things like spoilers, uh, channels, threads, roles. So kind of like a mixed experience um, storytelling. Uh, right now, it's a bit quiet, but maybe someday we can pick it up again and it can pick up steam. I remember that first hex map, and I remember posting for it, and I going, this is a great little thing, um, just to kind of get the creative juices flowing, you know, like when you're, because there's obviously there's one project that you're doing, and you're like, okay, this is a big thing I need to, but it's nice to just be like, here's a cool prompt, I'll answer it, 500 words, 250 words, and it still feels like a little rewarding experience um, that people then will interact with. So I, I personally really enjoyed that. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, going back, not going back, but rather, um, how much of your personal experience uh, growing up in the Philippines affected your work? Do you find that, does it have a kind of like, does it inform the kind of story, the mm -hmm. kind of references or styles you pull, or do you find that that's not really? I think it was more of seeing that there were so many stories in the Philippines, so many people, so many perspectives. I've I've had to create a video for a rebel group in one of the Southern islands. I've had to see um, basically labor slaves. Um, what do you say it? I have to imagine, I've had to see them making t-shirts and be poorly paid for their time. I've seen really rich people 
uh, throw away um, high-tech gadgets because it was no longer fancy. There's so many people and so many stories to tell. And this is the same for every country, but in the Philippines, it seems like it's all mixed together in a syncretic chaos of colonialism and uh, globalization and our own native cultures and regions. And it's so fascinating and such a hotbed of inspiration. So whether from the past or today, there will be millions of stories to tell and the Philippines has it in, in diamond spades. I, uh, uh, tell me, because I'm really fascinated by um, the effects of colonization across, uh, yeah, or rather across the world and how it's kind of created uh, very similar experiences, no matter where you are, while still being somewhat unique because they are affected by the unique cultural setting that, for me, like I often think of colonization as this wet blanket that fell over the world. And so the people kind of uh, the 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 layers that you see underneath are different, but the overall picture there's a thematic issue that connects everything. Um, and so just tell me what are some color, like effects of colonization contrasting with um, local Philippine culture that have fascinated. Something just came to mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing that was um, something that I tried. I really intensely studied for a while was folklore religion because um, the Sp Spanish, they were the ones who colonized the Philippines and Mexico. And they really used religion to get the natives to their cause. But religion doesn't isn't so neat uh, when you try to introduce a new one. It's not like it completely replaces the old one. It becomes a blend. So we would have interesting folkloric versions of Christianity, like the reverence for the child Jesus Santo Nino, yeah. where um, you there are instances where you touch his feet, you get blessed by a special Santo Nino statue that is stored in a church. There would be, uh, during the Lenten season, people who would literally crucify themselves to enact the resurrection of Christ. And you don't get this with the vanilla Christianity. <laughs> you get this with the Philippine Floods version. I see. So, yeah, but it it's definitely not in the original native um, native setting. So it's it's interesting because while colonialism is a wet blanket, as you've said, that doesn't stop the world from having peaks or valleys or mountains or new shapes it's just a blend yeah yeah definitely um i also know because the philippines uh has a lot if i have very limited understanding of this but uh, and you can correct me here but also i know that buddhism hinduism also made their way to uh, the philippines uh is that still like a thing that you see as part of the social fabric, uh, or is that now because Christianity maybe has taken? So it's a long history. There has been history of trade with Chinese and Japanese and other cultures pre-colonialization. But uh, Christianity, when the Spaniards started becoming more uh, widespread in their colonization, Christianity started becoming the predominant religion in the northern and the center regions. In the southern region, it's Islam that uh, stayed. Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, they are practitioners, but to a much lesser extent to compared to these religions. That's fascinating. And I also find that often Christianity, and because Christianity and Islam both have Abrahamic roots, uh, they, they, they tend to also kind of oddly not get along, but they do tend to spread equally in the same place. If there's a, going to be a transition, it's a far easier leap to do uh, from one to the other. Uh, fascinating. Are, are these, because the, I'm curious uh, as someone who, like you said, you know, uh, you're exploring um, your own history through 
your work are there anything that is there anything that you want to explore going forward that you're particularly uh, born from mm -hmm. culture for me it's been difficult to incorporate philippine culture and history because i feel out of that and i feel like for something that is real i should be a little bit more respectful and definitely do my own research and besides there are fantastic rpgc people who already do the work like um makapatag and vj desha but there are definitely more themes I want to explore, more stories like developing that game about home and longing, as well as doing a little bit more world building, which might post writing, but I'll have to ask you for help. <laughs> yeah, by all means, do that. I would love to be helpful <laughs> in any way. Uh, yeah, if you could tell me about some creators who have been uh, bringing or representing that we should look out for and also if there's any other uh, future project that you're working on that you can already talk about then like that okay uh so i think i've mentioned two creators uh makapatag also known as waxa vedra who is creating gubat banwa which is a uh D fourth ed inspired tactical martial arts combat fantasy game okay, okay. <laughs> Sounds and, like a lot. I like it. Yeah, pulls from a lot of Philippine cultural roots and really celebrates a world where colonialism didn't happen and the Philippine culture is awesome as heck. There's also BJ Resho, who has so much in-depth knowledge about Philippine lore and history. And he writes as if there is a tender touch on Philippine culture. Like he brings it to the tabletop realm with a humor, a wit, and a love for what makes Philippine culture unique. So I really love that uh, work. Um, and also full disclosure, he's my partner, so I am biased. <laughs> okay. uh, aside from that, in the region, there are more writers doing works with cultural touch points. Chao Han from Singapore, uh, and also Zedex Yu from Malaysia, whose works have definitely been amazing. And I even by a deep love of their roots. And uh, is there anything that you're working on that you can already tell us about? Uh, or anything that we should keep an uh, eye out for? Like uh, maybe the next translation. Is there a ARC translation that we need to look out for? Or Italians, but there will be a proper um, announcement on that. Something that is happening quite soon, though, is Noblin Jam, yes. which starts on May 1. So if you've played, read, or want to do either of those for ARC, Doom Tabletop RPG, Noblin Jam is an opportunity to be inspired, spurred, to create, and connect with others who are also making stuff with ARC. Awesome. Uh Momotos, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been a very enlightening conversation. Um, and um, this is us, uh, everybody. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in a week from now. Peace.